we are going to be rounding off the day with Robin Marks, um, who is a web performance expert at Akamai. Uh, Robin's traveled to us uh, from uh, Hesselt in, in Belgium. Uh, is that still right? Is that still where you're based? Hasselt, Belgium, uh, and so hasn't had to come too far, but no, still, it's a, it's a, it's a journey. We're very happy to see him here. Uh, a web performance uh, expert at Akamai, as I mentioned, uh, and I know that Robin gets deep into the weeds in protocols and optimizing things, and really, I don't, he, he goes to the places that I'm, I'm, I'm glad people do that I don't have to, uh, because it gets way deeper than I would ever be able to comprehend. Uh, but uh, And is also a contributor to the IETF uh, Quick Working Group, um, and... In this talk, I think we're going to hear some things that are a little bit deep, but also relaying them to real-world uh, examples and real-world usages, which for me always lands the point much better. Uh, if we can talk about things and how they're actually applied in the real world, it's always always really valuable to me. So, uh, uh, talking a little bit about using kind of tools and insights correctly, uh, this title, Resourcing Loading at the Cutting Edge. You good? You plugged in? You happy? Think so. He thinks so. Is All right, uh, let's make him certain of that by giving him a giant round of applause. Uh, welcome him, please. It's Robin Marks. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. I am Robin. And there we go. I'm Robin. And really, the only reason that I am speaking here today is because of a misunderstanding. You see, when they asked me to come talk about cutting edge networking, I thought, well, that's interesting, because in my free time, I am actually a longsword fencer. A huh? sport called historical European martial arts. So when I heard cutting edge, I thought, well, <laughs> that's right up my alley. Right? You can imagine my disappointment when it turned out that when you guys say cutting edge, you mean the latest and greatest, not that I would get to play with swords. Now, luckily, it all turned out well in the end, you know, because I do happen to know a little bit about this stuff um, as well. And as you can see, we are very spoiled nowadays, right? These are all network performance features that have come out the last two years. And just looking at this, you know, you might think, oh, networking performance is in a very good state right now, right? I mm, don't actually agree with that. <laughs> My opinion is a bit more like this. You know, or to be very accurate, maybe this, you know, and I'm at night in a flaming room saying, this is fine. Um, my goal today is not really to convince you that I'm right, you know, it's just an opinion. Uh, my goal is more to explain to you why this is my opinion, so that maybe we might have a discussion about it afterwards. I'm going to talk a lot about priorities today. If the clicker is working if the clicker is working. There we go, priorities today. You might notice if you go into the browser DevTools, the networking tab, each resource has a priority associated with it. So it has something to do with resource loading. Question is, why do we need these priorities in the first place? Well, it all has to do because bandwidth is not unlimited, right? If you have a five megabyte page, it's not going to load instantly. It needs some time on the network. Especially if a new connection, it begins in something called slow start, right? It can only send about 14 to 50 kilobytes in the first round trip. This then doubles the second, doubles again the third. We don't need to know the details today. The only thing we need to know is that at the beginning of especially a cold page load, the amount of data we can send is very, very low. And so we need to be smart about what we actually send. So let's say we have a server that it can send 200 kilobytes, on HTTP 2 and 3, it will probably have received several requests on that one connection. So how will it fill these 200 kilobytes? You might say, Robin, that is very easy. It's just going to send the parser blocking JavaScript, right? Very important. The question then is, how would the server know that this is actually parser blocking? Right? It could have been tagged as async or defer by, uh, in the HTML. And in that case, it might be, make more sense to send the CSS or even the image. The answer there is that the server can't notice. The server does not have this context. The only entity that does have this is, of course, the browser, because that is what passing the HTML and seeing all these hints. So the browser somehow needs to communicate to the server in which all the resources should be sent. Now, we don't want to send all of this detail. That's way too complex. So we need a kind of like a high-level signal 
just to let the server know in what order stuff should be sent. Right? And that is exactly what these priorities are supposed to be. High-level signals from the browser to the server. And here the, ser the server can just say, OK, I'm first going to send all the highest priority stuff, then the high, then the medium, then the low, and so on. Right? Very simple concept. Now you might start thinking, well, how does that actually work internally? What is the mechanism? Right? If you would have to design this yourself, you might come up with something like this. Right? Just use an HTTP request header. Very simple. In practice, slightly more complex, especially for HTTP2. We have this thing called the prioritization tree, where the position of the resource in the tree depends, uh, determines which bandwidth it gets and when. Some have called this an elegant system. I like to refer to it as a Lovecraftian horror that sucks all the joy out of my life. It's terribly complex. Very buggy in most implementations, as we'll also see later. Which is why for HTTP 3, we actually decided to do it a bit more easy. <laughs> so again, this is just a HTTP request header. Slightly more complex, though. We have two parameters. The first one is urgency, which is the U, which is basically the priority, but numerical. Where 0 is actually the highest priority, and 7 is the lowest priority. So it's inverted, right? Remember that, because you're going to need that later. <laughs> Urgency is really exactly what I explained before. You expect the, the server first to send everything with an urgency of 0, then 1, then 2, and so on. That makes sense. There is, however, a second parameter there called incremental, which is a Boolean, true or false. Well, this does let's explore. Simple example. What happens if the Boolean is false? We have three resources, the same urgency. What this would mean is that the browser expects the server to send them in request order, right? So download the first one fully before moving on to the next one. I'm going to be calling this a sequential behavior next. This is very different from if that incremental Boolean would be true. This is basically telling the server, you know what? I want you to start sending these resources in chunks. Send a chunk of the first, then stop, move to the second, the third, and then go to the first one again. Basically, you're getting a bit, little bit of bandwidth sharing between these different resources. This is useful in a number of use cases. For example, let's say you have a lot of very large resources and a lot of smaller ones after that. If you do that sequentially, you will actually end up blocking the smaller resources behind the large ones. And so in this case, it might make sense to do this, the smaller ones get in much earlier because they get a little, be little bit of bandwidth at the start. Right? Another use case is because a lot of file formats can actually do something useful when, even, when they're even partially downloaded. So images, again, most formats can be loaded at least top-down. Or in the case of like progressive JPEGs, you might start with a low-quality version first, which then gets better as more data comes in. So this is very useful for some use cases, but it can also be very bad for others. Specifically, JavaScript, CSS, and fonts need to be fully downloaded to be used. They can often be parsed or compiled incrementally, but they need to be 100% there before they're actually executed. And if you would load those types of resources incrementally, you might actually be actively delaying when that happens. So you should never do this for these types of resources. Spoiler alert, that's of course exactly what happens. Now, this is the theory. Before we go to the practice, I would like to invite my colleague, Tim Vereke, to the stage. If you didn't know, Tim is actually also a speaker here tomorrow. Now, please don't tell Tim this, but he is kind of an annoying colleague. Tim is often very mean to me. So today I'm going to teach Tim a lesson. Because Tim, tell us, how much do you know about sword fighting? Nothing. Perfect. Right, because Tim, I'm going to show you three different sword fighting styles throughout the ages. We're going to start in the 60s. Uh, the only thing I want you to do is very simple. One of the most basic attacks you can do. You start on the right shoulder. And you're just going to throw me a diagonal cut towards me like this. With a step, Tim. With a step. Very important. There we go. He can follow basic instructions. 
Excellent. So Tim, as you can see, 16th century, by then, sword fighting was actually already a bit of a sport, right? It was mostly to show off, which you can see in the puffy pants, and also the fancy stances that they used to take, right? So in this style, if Tim would attack me, do the attack again, all right? What I would probably do is I'm going to beat away his sword, very cool, like this, and continue to swing and hit Tim in the face with the flat of the blade. Because my aim is to maim, not to kill. That's different in the 15th century. 15th century style, if you would attack me with the same attack, with a step. There we go. I would probably catch it like this. I would then do something which is called a winden, which is used to give me more leverage on the blade, after which I can put my point online and stab him in the chest. Right? Very efficient. The 14th century, this is real battlefield stuff, you know, very practical. In that style, if Tim would attack me, right, I would also block probably like this. But then I would say, Tim, what a nice knee you have. It would be a shame if something were to happen to it. So this technique is you kick the knee, hopefully breaking it, which will cause him to buckle, which leaves me free to revert my sword, use the pommel to knock out most of Tim's teeth. Okay. So Tim, I hope you've learned, you've learned your lesson. You can go sit back down, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Now, if you think I was being a little bit hard on Tim just now, uh, believe me, it could have been worse. It could have been so much worse. <laughs> now, why am I telling you this? It's cool, fine. Uh, same sword, same thing, same principle, very different styles, right? Very different approaches. This is, of course, true for priorities as well, right? Same basic mechanism, but implementations will use this very, very differently. We're going to start by looking at the browsers. We're going to focus just on the urgency for now. We can see that the browsers kind of agree that HTML is important, <laughs> highest priority. CSS on the bottom, it's either high or highest, OK. But fonts, Firefox does not care about your marketing department. OK? Custom fonts are low priority which is the exact opposite of Chrome, which is highest priority, right? Let's make it worse. Let's look at JavaScript. Many different ways of loading JavaScript. Chrome and Firefox first. Chrome and Firefox agree that JavaScript in the head, parser blocking, high priority. After that, Firefox doesn't really care what you do with your JavaScript. It's all medium priority to Firefox. Chrome is a little bit more fine-grained, if it's async or defer, it's going to take that as a clear signal that it's not parser blocking and it can be a lower priority load there as well, right? Makes some sense. Let's look at Safari. Safari does not care where your JavaScript is in the HTML, okay? And the only exception is async, which it moves to medium. I find this a bit weird. Why is defer not a medium? So the explanation people have given to me is that is because defer ends up blocking the DOM content loaded event, right? And should be slightly higher priority. My question then would be, well, then shouldn't Chrome also have it at a higher priority than async? You know, maybe, <laughs> if that was the reason. Let's make it worse. Let's talk about preload. Very specific case. What happens if we preload an async or defer JavaScript file? What do you think will be the priority of the preload request. You might be naive and think, oh, it's going to be the same, right? Because preload does not change priority. It only changes when a request is made, <laughs> right? Not really. Especially in Chrome, the priority is going to get bumped from low to high. It's actually, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because by the time the browser discovers the preload, it doesn't know this JavaScript is going to be defer or async, right? It hasn't parsed that part yet, and there's no way to indicate on a preload that it will be that in the end. So the browser has too little context 
to make the full decision. In this case, Chrome and Safari are going to be very conservative. They're like, there is a chance this is going to be parser blocking, so I'm going to put it at high. Firefox does not agree. It says, if you want it to be parser blocking, you shouldn't be using preload. Okay? It's going to be in the medium column. The thing is that the conservative browsers are not actually very consistent with this. For example, in Safari, if you preload an image, it's actually going to go down in priority. Same in Chrome, if you preload a font, it's going to go from highest to high. Again, for good reasons, but the point is this is very inconsistent, and so potentially confusing to developers. Originally, I was going to make it even worse to talk about images, but <laughs> I just can't, okay? That's way too much. Uh, the main thing I wanted to highlight here is that Chrome has recently added something new, where it assigns the first five images in the body a medium priority, which is higher than the default of low. It tries to do this to improve LCP, even if people are not using fetch priority, right? So if you have newer traces, you might see that show up, and then you know where that is actually um, coming from. So we've talked about urgency. Let's talk about incremental next. The browser needs to decide which resources can be incremental or sequential. The simplest things to do is to just say, <laughs> everything is sequential, which is basically what Firefox is doing, or everything is incremental, which is what Safari is doing. Everything, including JavaScript, CSS, and fonts, which really shouldn't be. You might think, Robin, why, why this rough thing? Can't we be more fine-grained? Right? Because the priority stuff is being sent on a per-request basis. Right? So we can change this per request that we make. And of course, that's possible. This is actually what Firefox does for HTTP2. It has a very fine-grained logic there, but they've actually switched to a more coarse-grained logic for HTTP3, which I find endlessly fascinating because Chrome has done the exact opposite. <laughs> HTTP2, Chrome, everything is sequential. HTTP3, quite recently, Chrome changed to default having everything incremental, except for JavaScript, CSS, and fonts, as it should be. Okay? Now, I personally don't fully agree with this change in Chrome. It means that all images are now being incrementally loaded, so bandwidth sharing. And that's not a problem for most image formats, but it's very unclear what this is doing to AVIF, right? The latest and greatest in the font formats. I've even asked experts about this, and even they can't tell me if EVIF is able to be rendered progressively top-down or not. And I've tested this myself, various AVIF encoders. I have never seen an incremental AVIF load in Chrome today. So this needs a bit more research, fair, but if this is true, if you're using AVIF over HTTP3 right now, you might be actually severely degrading your rendering of images because they all need to wait until they're fully loaded, but they're all stealing bandwidth from each other at the same time, right? So again, needs a bit more work, but I suspect this will need a change in Chrome in the near future. But the worst part about all of this is that I was just talking that browsers are inconsistent uh, when you look at different browsers. That makes some sense, but now I'm telling you that the browsers are inconsistent with themselves, okay? Depending on the protocol you're using, they have different behavior, which is the opposite of what another browser is doing. <laughs> it's almost as if these people don't actually know what the best approach is, <laughs> which is kind of sobering thought. Now, I've been dunking too much in the browsers. Let's talk about the nights in the server room. As you may know, a couple of years ago, Andy Davies and Patrick Meenan, they looked at service HTTP2 prioritization how well they actually listen to the browser signals. They found out that most of them are actively broken, not doing this correctly. I've recently been redoing some of these tests for both H2 and H3 for a lot of the very big deployments, very well-known servers. The results are not positive. Now, I am not going to show you which result is for which backend. <laughs> My aim is not to blame. <laughs> Right? My aim is to show how widespread this 
issue is even in the biggest deployments in the world. Now, the results I'm going to show, for reasons I'll talk about later, are not using web page test. They're using my own tools, um, which are very similar, though. So you have like a waterfall equivalent that you will sometimes see, and then you have what is called the connection view, which is basically the waterfall condensed into a single line, so it's easier to see patterns. Right. So the first test, very simple. I have 10 resources, same urgency, not incremental. What I'm trying to tell the server is, I want you to deliver these to me in request order, back to back. So this is a good example, right? This is a server that is listening to the signals that I am sending it. Nice. This one is not. Right? This one is basically just ignoring my incremental flag and just sending everything incrementally, doing the act opposite of what I had asked. Now, interestingly, there are several variations of this going on. This is another one. You can see the screenshot is a bit blurred. <laughs> this is because this one actually switches resource every single packet. So a different color every packet, while the other one switches every 15 packets. So it shows up as a bit larger chunks. Both of them, of course, are not doing what it should be. The opposite use case. So again, 10 resources, all the same urgency, but this time incremental is on. Right? So this is what we now expect to happen. And as we just saw, yes, there are some servers that do this, <laughs> obviously. There are some that get this mostly right. You know, sometimes they get confused and they, they do switch back to a sequential bit, but mostly it's okay. And then you have some that don't really seem to get the assignment. You know? I think this is like a cat. You know, do you want to go out? Do you want to stay in? Do you want to do both? I don't know but you're not doing what I want you to do. The last example is a bit more complex. Again, 10 resources, the first four, and the last four are going to be relatively low priority, so high urgency, right? But the two in the middle, number five and six, the uh, light blue and the scarlet one, those are actually going to be a much higher priority, right? So what I expect to happen is that these two are actually indeed going to be sent First, even though they request it later, they should be sent first because they have a higher priority. Right? So this is a good server that does this. Of course, you have servers that do this. This is expected by now. Sadly, you also have servers that just do this. That basically ignore the urgency, that only look at the request order. Luckily, they're still doing sequential. That's about all you can say about this. Right? Now, I could keep going. <laughs> I've, of course, tested more complex things and more realistic things as well. But I think you can all agree that if they even struggle to get the basics right, how can you expect them to do well on the more complex cases? Right? Now, some of you might say, Robin, that's not very fair. This is HTTP 3. We've only had that for two years. Um, OK, might be a fair argument. I don't agree, but might be. So let's look at HTTP 2. It's gotten to be a little bit of a hobby of mine to every time I see a bad <laughs> HTTP2 waterfall to take a screenshot or a picture. Um, so just a couple of examples. Clearly multiplexing behavior, which is in Chrome, which it shouldn't be doing. Delaying important JavaScript and especially fonts. Right? This one is particularly fun. You actually get an inversion of the order. <laughs> the last request is sent first, back up. Might not matter too much for images. You can imagine if this happens for JavaScript or CSS, could be a much bigger problem. And my favorite is from the We Love Speed conference earlier this year in Paris, where the speaker was talking about like relatively minor issue with deferred JavaScript. And I was sitting there in the public going like, there is something seriously wrong <laughs> with this HTTP2 server. Strangely, though, the speaker didn't even mention this at all, right? Even though this was a much bigger problem than the defer stuff that he was actually explaining. I found that very weird. And I think it is because people don't really know what a proper waterfall should look like. Most servers are so broken that I think some of you might think this is actually normal. <laughs> might have thought before <laughs> that this is actually normal. But this is just how it's supposed to work, because you don't know any better, right? 
I could keep going. The end result is that only two, only two of these companies do this correctly. The other ones are broken, some of them mildly, some of them completely. Okay. Which is a very bad state for the industry. So yeah, I think by now you're starting to see why I have this opinion, right? But some of you might still be skeptical. You might think, Robin, I think you're lying, right? Because if what you're telling us is true, that would be terrible for the web, right? Nothing would actually load, right? That would be very, very slow. And that's obviously not the case, right? And you have a good point there. But there are a few things, a few shielding factors in play that actually hide us from the worst of these issues. Some of them intentionally, some of them not. I'm going to talk about three of them right now. <coughs> so the first thing is that network performance oftentimes actually isn't the most important thing, <laughs> right? If you have a very optimized site and you're using a CDN, your network is probably going to be fast enough to compensate for most of these issues. On the other end, if you have a five megabyte JavaScript file, you have worse problems than the network. Okay. Another thing that will help mitigate this, maybe not yet, but definitely in the future, is of course fetch priority, where we can actually indicate for various resources what urgency they should be requested as. You might take from this syntax that you can actually control this directly, right? That you might also set highest or lowest, but that's actually not how it works. This should really be read as higher or lower than the default browser priority, right? So you're not really controlling the urgency, you're kind of bumping it to one of both sides. And even that doesn't always work. Like for example, in Chrome, you can bring an image from low to high, but if you add fetch priority low, that's actually not gonna do anything, it's gonna stay at low. The inverse for fonts, fonts are already highest, they can't go anymore. But even if you specify low, it's gonna go from highest to high, not to low. <coughs> Sorry. In fact, the only resource type that I know of that allows you to bump in both directions is actually late discovered JavaScript. So JavaScript at the bottom of the page, for example, that will allow you to go from medium to high or medium to low. Right. So important to note, and there's a different caveat here as well, this only allows you to control urgency. Right? So there is currently no way in this API to control incremental. You are stuck with whatever the browser decides is good for you. As I've explained before, that is not necessarily what is actually good for you. Still, I think fetch priority is an excellent thing. I will think this will help mitigate a lot of the browser inconsistencies that I have talked about before. And this was Chrome only for a very long time. Not really, but very long to me. <laughs> but I'm very happy to say that this has actually been in a Safari preview since a couple of weeks. I've been playing around with that. It actually works quite well. And Firefox also has a very active implementation effort for this. So very soon you will be able to start using this in production, which is very good. And the last thing, mitigating factor, that I want to talk about is something called tight mode, also something called two-phase loading. I think this is the single most important reason why the internet is not on fire today, right? This is the one thing that makes all these priority issues much less visible than they otherwise would be. You might notice, right, most browsers are going to load resources into big chunks, right? This is not because these resources are discovered late or anything, right? They are all in the HTML, they're all identified by the preload scanner early on, but the browser actively delays requesting them until a later point in time. And it's not just Chrome doing this, it's of course also Safari and Firefox, though they are somewhat less advanced in their logic than um, Chrome. So as I said, single most important feature to help us with this, which is why I find it so ironic 
that it is also one of the least documented features in the entire web platform, okay? There is literally like two blog posts and one Google Doc that has like three paragraphs of very high level in, uh, explanation, and that's it, okay? So for this talk, I wanted to really know what was going on there. So one of the things I did, I actually interviewed uh, Patrick Meenan, in case you don't know him, he's a speaker here tomorrow as well. He's also the main guy implementing this in Chrome. He wrote the document. <laughs> and so he explained a lot of this to me, and it was very interesting. But I quickly found out that this is so nuanced and so complex and so many edge cases that it would be completely impossible for me to do this justice during this talk. Okay, so I'm not even going to try. The good news is that you have one of my infamous long-form blog posts to look out for, right? Perf calendar, yay. Um, <laughs> but for today, I'm just gonna give you the very high-level, very un-nuanced uh, reasons why this actually matters in practice. So what the browser high-level is doing, it's basically, again, of course, looking at priorities. It's gonna gather all the high and highest priority resources, independent of where they are, in the document, and then also a couple of less important, just to help them make progress as well. And they're gonna start loading those in the first phase. When that phase is done, which is usually when the head is done, when the head is fully processed, then the browser is going to kick off the second phase with most of the other resources in there, right? Now, why does this work? It basically reduces the amount of in-flight requests, right? So even if you have a bad server that doesn't listen to priorities, that sends everything incrementally, it is only stealing bandwidth within, let's say, the first 10 to 15 resources. It's still an issue, but it's much less impactful than if it would be sharing bandwidth between all 100 resources <laughs> that might be on the page, right? So this somewhat unintentionally, maybe, I don't know, uh, lowers the impact of the prioritization issues considerably. They're definitely still there, they're just much less visible because of this thing um, that is in play. The thing is, this is so complex, so heuristics driven, and so badly documented that it's also easy to make mistakes that make this thing go wrong. Just one example, this is something that I've seen as like an emerging best practice, right? If you want to make sure your largest contentful paint image is loaded as soon as possible, you should preload it with fetch priority high. Right? You've probably heard about this. I would agree if that preload is in the bottom of the head after the JavaScript and the CSS. Because if it's not, you might get something like this. Where the image is actually sent first, <laughs> delaying your parser blocking, JavaScript, and CSS. And this is actually expected, right? Because the fetch priority high makes the image high priority. The JavaScript also has high priority. And the preload is the first one to come in. <laughs> and so the server, even a well-behaving server, will delay your JavaScript in this case. Right? Now some of you might be Robin, well, a duh, that's expected, right? We all know the order of things in the HTML matters. Makes sense. I would argue, sure, but <laughs> this is a very easy food gun, right? This is very easy to get wrong. And in some cases, you might even have situations where developers can't fully control where these things end up. Right? If you're using certain frameworks or you're using multiple teams, you might not have full control over where this ends up, and it's very easy to get quite a bad impact from this. I could keep going, but you know, the message is clear. Um, even though there are some mitigating factors, there are some features that shield us from the worst of these things, that does not mean that the problem is gone. It just means that it's not always as visible as it might be. The final part of my talk is going to be about tooling. The idea is here that my sword is a tool, right? A tool to be used. Now, sometimes if you look at the medieval manuscripts, you sometimes see people holding swords like that. 
that they put their left hand on the blade, which is very weird because those are sharp blades, <laughs> right? Now, the context here is very important because what you need to know is this really only supposed to be used if you are in full armor, right? Because in that case, you can whack at each other as much as you want. <laughs> Even with sharp swords, that's not going to do much. So what you're going to do here, you're going to grab the sword and basically turn it into kind of a miniature spear. You're basically using the sharp point, you're going to try to stab your opponent where they're least protected. For example, under the chin, or in the elbow, or you could go for the crown jewels. Right? Now the point is that the context matters, right? Same tool can be used in very different ways and very different in effectiveness depending on the context. And you could even make the argument that if the context changes enough, you should probably also change your tools. Now, why am I talking about this? It's because I think we actually have very good web performance tooling. I really do. I'm very happy about what we have right now. However, I do think we have some work to do specifically on networking feature support, right? Tools in general are good, but they're not very uh, uh, made, they're not adequately made to do this kind of networking debugging. For example, one of my strong opinions is that one of the main reasons all of this prioritization stuff has gone under the radar for so long is because the Chrome waterfall in the DevTools doesn't actually show the resource chunks when they come in, unlike web page test. Right? I think if Chrome would do that, or had done that for the past few years, it would have been much more obvious that things were going wrong to many more people. Another example was about a year ago. I was talking to some of our engineers and I said, you know, guys, we really need to support HTTP3 prioritization. And they said to me, oh, Robin, that's not urgent, you know, because we looked into it and none of the browsers support it. I was very confused because I had literally just ran tests <laughs> showing that all of the browsers were using it. So what they said is, you know, we looked at the spec and the spec says this thing uses an HTTP request header. We looked at the browser dev tools and we saw no priority headers, so the browsers are not using it, right? That was a very long and very awkward conversation with a very senior engineer who didn't believe that dev tools don't always show you the whole truth. In fact, they are sometimes even actively lying to you. Okay. Another example from uh, last week. So I've been debugging uh, Safari fetch priorities. In the dev tools, if you put fetch priority low, that actually nicely shows up at low, but the high would stay at medium. And like I said, that might be true, right? Safari might not allow us to bump it higher than medium. That might be true. However, if you look at the waterfall, you can see that it did have some effects, right? Because the image is now suddenly moved to the first part of the tight mode, right? It's usually the second phase, and now it's suddenly the first phase. So it had some impact somewhere. So I went to look at what is actually happening on the network level. It turns out Safari is actually requesting the image as medium, default priority, and then immediately after that, increasing the priority to high. And it's just that the DevTools was not reflecting that update uh, in the UI. Interesting to note that Chrome until very recently had a similar issue that has been fixed. Chrome should now pro uh, properly show if uh, priorities have changed during the page load. That's Chrome and Safari. Firefox. Firefox sits on a throne of lies. Real trace, okay? So, first resource, highest priority. I would expect urgency zero, right? Remember, urgency is the lower number is the more higher priority. They put it at one, okay? I can live with that. The second, uh, the next three resources are at high, right? High is one lower than highest, so I would expect two. Turns out it's three, right? A bit weird, but maybe they are intentionally skipping number two. Who knows? Makes fine. The next three are again highest. 
Excellent. We know what that means. Highest priority is an urgency of one. Or not. Okay, no worries, slight bug. But of course, the next six are all normal. Okay, very predictable. They're all going to be the same. And normal, that's basically medium. That's one lower than high. So we expect it to be four, maybe five, right? Of course, what we get, the first four are two, <laughs> and then the last two are three again, even though they're all normal. Um, now, I'm sure there are perfectly reasonable explanations for this. The point I'm trying to make is that I don't know these explanations. And to me, this seems very, very inconsistent and very difficult. And I might regard this as buggy, unuseful DevTools. The last thing I wanted to show is one of my favorite bugs ever. Okay? I was browsing some Akamai sites, and I saw the top waterfall. Red flags everywhere. We were incrementally sending CSS. Should never happen. So I escalate to an engineer and I say, look, this needs to be fixed immediately, right? We need to start sending resources like this sequentially. That's what the browser is telling us. The engineer immediately told me to calm down. Fair. And he said, well, actually, it's, we are sending sequentially. The code doesn't even allow us to send. <laughs> multiplexed, it has to be sequentially. Your tool must be wrong. I'm like, no way. Web page test is the best thing to happen to web performance since Internet Explorer 6. Okay? There is no way that tool is wrong, right? It's the engineer who is wrong, and I'm going to prove it. And I'm going to use web page test to do it. Because web page test is this cool feature. You can actually capture a network uh, dump of all the packets. This will then show up on the left of the waterfall. We can uh, download the TCP dump file and the TLS keys. You can then put these into another tool, which is called Wireshark, which will show you per packet information on the network. What Wireshark is showing us is that each resource gets assigned a number. So the two CSS files on top, they get 9 and 11. But then we see that indeed, all the data for number 9 is sent sequentially. Number 9 is fully downloaded before number 11 starts to come in. So, Web, uh, so Wireshark says the engineer is actually right. Web page test must be wrong. Luckily, no. <laughs> Turns out both of the tools were actually right. What's happening here actually is that the data is coming in in the correct order on the Wireshark side, on the network, it is then passed into Chrome. Now, Chrome is a very complex piece of software. <laughs> it has many different processes and threads, and somewhere along all of that complexity, something happens that makes the data go multiplexed, becomes interchanged, right? And it turns out what WebPageTest is actually showing is more akin to like one of the final steps in that pipeline, when the data actually becomes ready to use by, let's say, the rendering uh, process there, right? And so, in this case, I wouldn't actually call that a bug in web page test, right? It is showing when the data becomes, usual, uh, becomes usable, and that is, in this case, not what you expect. So that's actually good. The problem here was more in the context, right? I am trying to use web page test as a network debugging tool even though it was not fully made for that, because it's not showing the pure network stuff, it is showing the higher level stuff, right? So it's about context and expectations. And so even if tools get things right, it can still sometimes be very difficult to interpret. And I'm finally ready to wrap up, right? I think it's very clear now why I have this opinion, right? The point I'm trying to make is that if you have a sharp sword, the edges can cut you both ways. So we have all these cool new networking features that can definitely help improve performance, yes, but they can also very easily deteriorate it if used incorrectly. And I've been focusing a lot on these priorities today, right? But it's not just them. 
all of these features here, I've been debugging the past year, all of them have similar issues. Okay? It's actually very systemic. I think the fact that this has remained under the radar for so long is, again, ma mainly tooling support. Right? I think we have focused a lot on optimizing front-end performance, but network has stayed by the roadside. And in many cases, that's probably fine. It doesn't matter all that much. Right? I agree with that. However, sometimes it really does, and it can go wrong quite badly. Like, for example, when WordPress decided to lazy load all of their images, even the LCP ones. Right? And they didn't do this because the WordPress devs are idiots, right? Obviously, they are not. This probably is because they didn't fully understand what the lazy loading feature was supposed to do, and they didn't have tooling that immediately showed that something was wrong. And this is a very important point for the wider web ecosystem, because we have a very big over-reliance on Chromium Core Web Vitals and the Chrome Crux dataset. This might be OK for desktop. Might be. But especially for mobile, of course, you will have a lot of Safari and iOS traffic. Two of the platforms that have the biggest lack of tooling that you can imagine. They also don't support Core Web Vitals. They are not present in the Crux dataset. They are a very big blind spot, right? Now, the RUM archive data I'm using here is a bit biased. It's mostly biased towards rich Western countries. You could make the argument that some regions will be more heavily Android biased. Fine. The main point I'm trying to make is that most of our pages load much slower in Safari and iOS than they potentially could. And that's a problem. <laughs> so I think it's time for a change. I think we need to first educate ourselves, learn to recognize these issues. I hope my talk is a good example of that. I then think we should, keep, uh, we should make these companies accountable for their buggy implementations, both the browsers and the servers. I think one of the main ways how to do that is through improved tooling. I think we need to add more network features to existing tools. I think we maybe need to create new tools specifically for network debugging. And I would like to highlight uh, Debug Bear here. They have been adding a ton of network-related features in their tools in the past year. Excellent, excellent work. I think it's a very good beginning, but I think we need a much wider, more concerted, industry-wide effort to improve this over the biggest course. Now, I'm perfectly happy to help lead that charge, right? But I still hope I can have some discussions with you. So if you have any thoughts on this or ideas or feedback, please come find me, you know, after this today or tomorrow. And maybe we can kickstart some of this to help improve this down the line. Now at the end, I would once again like to invite Tim to the stage. I want to teach Tim one final lesson. Tim, I'm going to teach you about something called the Mordschlag. Literally, the killing blow. It's when you take your sword and half sword, and you're going to use the cross guard or the pommel as kind of a war hammer. What this does against an armored opponent, sometimes the cross guard just goes straight through the armor, killing instantly. And even if it does, it will leave a big dent, which is often just as effective. It's such an effective technique, in fact, now, this is one of the very few techniques that is banned even from modern sword fighting tournaments. So that's why I'm going to demonstrate it on Tim right now. <laughs> Let's hope he doesn't have an accident. <laughs> now, there is one, one problem. Tim is annoying, yes, but he's not an idiot. Okay? The past 30 minutes, Tim has been scrolling on Google. <laughs> looking up sword fighting techniques. So he actually knows the counter to the Mordschlag, right? So Tim is going to go into half sword himself. Into half sword himself. Yes. 
and he's going to catch the Mordschlag over his head as I'm throwing it. Right? So what happens is this. Bam! Right? So Tim lives to fight another day. Now Tim is not an idiot, but even he can only do so much in 30 minutes. So Tim doesn't know that there is a counter to the counter. It's actually quite simple. The only thing that I need to do is to pull down my blade, like this, and I can then again use my pommel to make sure that Tim never eats solid food again. <laughs> so Tim, I hope you've learned your lesson. And I think you will all agree that if you use the Mordschlag, even if it gets counted, it's usually lights out, bye-bye, see you later. Kind of like this talk. So thank you all for your attention, and please a warm applause for Tim for being a good sport.